Paul Blanchard, welcome to Podcast Radio. How are you doing? I'm very well, Graeme. You good self? Yeah, very good. I've got to say that, you know, Media Masters is one of my go-to podcasts. I, I just love it. I love the way that you get the people on that have made a difference and we get to hear their story. And it's a real thrill to be able to get your story, which I think we should do in a Media Masters style, before we get <laughs> to specifically talk about the podcast itself. What about you? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I'm from York originally, um, mm. and I lived there for... 20 odd years and then moved to London to seek fame and fortune. Unfortunately, I'd secured neither. Um, but we lived, my wife and I lived there for about 10 years or so. And then we did the whole cliche thing about five years ago and moved to the countryside. We thought, you know, for the money we paid, we might as well get more space. So we, uh, I live deep in the heart of Buckinghamshire now, right in the middle of nowhere. And it's brilliant. The only problem I have is what I call the axe murderer problem, which is that if, uh, you know, if an axe murderer comes and gets us, by the time I've gotten three nines and Thames Valley Police have got here, we'll just be a puddle of chunky salsa on the floor. But, you know, that's why I watch a lot of karate films, as far as I'm concerned. Right, OK. So you haven't got the shotgun yet, then? Just in Not case. yet. It's no. only fear of prison that stops me from getting one, though. So the, <laughs> the criminal justice system does work. OK. All right. So when you were growing up as a kid, then, did you see yourself as a PR guru? No, I just didn't want a boss. Uh, my father uh, was and is an entrepreneur, and um, I always wanted to build up something for myself. And I hated the idea of sort of sitting down in a weekly review by someone, you know, monitoring my performance and all of that. I just hated that. So I, I started um, a small business when I was 17, a computer business, and sold that in my mid-20s. And then thought, you know, what do I want to do with myself? So I, I picked politics, law and PR and I, I picked all three because I had a bit of money and I thought well let's see which one which one I lasted mm -hmm. politics is about 12 years in and uh, stood for parliament and various other things you're that a Labour councillor too weren't you I was a sort of a parliament in 2005 and was on all various boards and committees and everything. I mean, it was it was great, but, you know, I was a, I was and is a huge Blairite. So when, when Gordon took over, you know, we had no chance of us lot. So that politics was the first to go. And I trained, I did a degree in law at night class, thought I might be a barrister, realised that, you know, I got my law degree, but I, I realised I didn't want to do that. And then I was left with sort of my day job, that uh, which was PR. And um, I'd gone into that because I, in my first business, I couldn't afford to advertise it. So I started to sort of do PR stunts locally. You know, I, I think I, I bought a book called Do Your Own PR. It's probably still available. Mm -hmm. And it sort of sort of said, you know, if you've got a phone and a laptop and, you know, you've got a bit of grit, then you can, you, why bother paying for advertising? So I thought, well, I'll give myself, um, give myself a go at that and then never look back, really. So what kind of stuff were you doing when you started out your first PR stunts? Oh God, we were we were doing all kinds of things. I mean, I was trying to grow grow the business. We were, you know, dressing as animals and various stunts. And <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I had a, a hotel in York that I worked with, and we did some on air cookery in the, um, you know, on the local radio station, and uh, that worked incredibly well. I mean, now it's easy easy done. You know, lots of people cook on in podcasts and on radio, but at the time it was. Fair, you know, the radio producer was like, what? That, that's not going to work. But, um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, I grew up from there and um, I thought L London sort of beckoned after a few years. And I thought that's that's the pond I want to fish in. So I, I, I started doing um, sort of what I would call proper PR in London many, many years ago. And then within a year or so, I, I decided that I wanted, I was inspired by Alistair Campbell, actually, who I know reasonably well. And uh, I was, I thought I want to be looking after chief executives and leaders of organizations and businesses and so on. So I, I didn't, I remember uh, talking to my wife saying, I wish there was a type of PR where you just do the leader of the business and you're not sort of churning out press releases for, you know, I, I think the analogy I used was if you, you know, if you've, own a tea bag company, then I don't want to be putting out press releases saying we've got a new range of tea bags out. I want to be looking after the he or you know the the, the leader of the business he or she that that wants to disrupt the industry or to get involved in politics or set up a family foundation or something. That was the kind of thing that I wanted to do really, and uh, and I just just created it out of thin air. And um, I thought I'd have four or five clients initially, but you know it's I mean, it's gone gone crazy. I've got about twenty at the moment. Wow. So you went down to London with basic when, when you set up in London, you, you set up with just a dream of, of setting up a London PR company. Yeah. And it was a bit like Dick Whittington because I'd kind of I'd kind of spent all my money and was a bit skint. So I had just enough to get down there. And then it was, you know, like the like they the say, you know, when these entrepreneurs reminisce, it was um, it, it was very stressful at the time insofar as. Um, you know, I didn't have much money, but it, actually I look back fondly now because it was also very freeing. It also meant I could then take the, the business in any direction I want. I had nothing, but I also had nothing to lose. 
Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it, that you know people who who've never had a decent amount of money, and I'm not saying I've had a decent amount, but happiness and money are, for me are definitely not connected. I think about the happiest time of my life was when I was the most skint, was when we lived in a one bedroom flat in Australia and I went to radio school. And it was just that the, this, what this could be, the, the hope of the future, is, is that what you found that kept you going? That if I get this right, this could be something else? I remember chatting with Hazel Blears at the time, if anyone remembers her, and she was she reminded me of that old adage that uh, money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you a more pleasant form of misery. And I've always <laughs> thought that I think if you're in debt and you've got no money and you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's stressful. And I think the absence of money can be incredibly stressful if you've got commitments. But I agree with you. Once you, once you reach a certain level of comfort and income, and you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul, at that point, you then, I mean, it's a great opportunity at that point, but you also got to think, well, what what do you want to do with yourself? Because your bills are paid. And, you know, I've had plenty of clients that have made several million and then think, well, do I want to go for hundreds of millions and take it to the next step? You know, I, I rent a boat in, you know, in, um, you know, in all the various posh, um, you know, yachting clubs and so on, but do I want to own one? And I think that's the point where you decide what level you want to be at, really. Yeah, I think happiness has got a lot, of, lot to do with hope. I think if you, like, if you're broke, you're skint, and you've got no hope, well, then you, that's miserable. But if you're skint but you've got hope, you can actually be quite happy. I think Absolutely, that, that's what it is. Yeah, it is amazing how many people though do look back on times when they were just struggling, but saying it was the best time. And uh, and it sounds like you've had the same experience. So, so well, I mean, it's part of life of being an entrepreneur, really, isn't it? Yeah. So with PR then, how important is PR? Well, I, I mean, it, it, there's, there's 47 different ways to answer that really, but I, I would say I came at PR because I couldn't afford to advertise, but now I come at it at a time kind of, um, you know, reputation management point of view. And it also depends on what stage of the, the you know, the, the business and you know, your career you're at. So if you're in the sort of takeoff phase of your career, then you need to turn up to the opening of an envelope and you need to be chasing mentions and publicity and uh, sort of working you out the ladder but you know we work with a lot of people who are very near the top of the ladder or or at the top and then you can you have to pick and choose because I think there's nothing worse than someone at that level that will still do anything large or small really you've got to try to think of how it comes across so for me it's PR now is more about it's not necessarily about chasing column inches or chasing appearances it's more deciding what, how you want to come across and how much you know what you want to reflect and part of that is the outward manifestation of what you actually want to do with yourself you know why are you hiring someone like me is it to grow your business is it to run alongside your traditional corporate PR and get your speaking opportunities you know to, to help you commercially to take your career to the next level because I mean we work with plenty of people who've, who've made so much money they don't they're not interested in making more money anymore now it's more about giving it away and it's about philanthropy and leaving a legacy and um you know, they, they again, they, they care more about impact rather than uh, that kind of thing. So I would say it's fewer but better quality mentions and sort of like really doing a deep dive on, on whose radar do you want to be and how do you want to come across and how much of yourself do you want to give as well? I think uh, that's another question that as you raise your head above the parapet, if you're genuinely a change maker and you're going to start to say controversial things to challenge the status quo, and it could be an industry, it could be government, it could be anything really, but that's going to that's going to threaten someone. Someone's not going to like that, and you have to decide whether you can take the brick back. So there's there's a whole there's a whole lot of thinking that I do with my clients before we've even set off really on the journey to sort of really deep dive define what success actually looks like um so that we can then orient all of our energies around that and i i always find that most pr campaigns because you know we i sit on the our side of the um the, the conference desk with my clients so i sit on the same side as them when they're we're talking to other pr agencies and they, they just want the retainer and i think a lot of you know a lot of agencies in that kind of retainer consultancy arrangement they they will sign up to do campaigns that they know won't work really but the failure event as i would call it might be seven or eight months away yeah. so but they think well i'll get seven or eight months worth of retainer in the meantime and i and i think lo so many campaigns fail right at the very first meeting because they're trying to achieve something that's unsustainable or or they've got an ambitious goal but they're going about it the wrong way and i would rather sort of really slow that meeting down and you know, get everyone on the same page and it'd be real because then it can, it just saves you wasting time later on. Is there such a thing as bad publicity? Um, 
Yes, I would say so. Um, I mean, you know, if you're going to get into trouble with, you know, the police or a- a- anything like that, I, I, I think sometimes people are prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt as well if you if you um, if you can try it as long as though it's genuine. I mean, I, I wrote a book, Fast PR, and I do talk about this that um, you know most chief executives are. Um, I put. I, I imagine. I say to my clients, imagine you're in a, a pizza restaurant and you're upstairs doing the books and then you hear from downstairs that that there's a a, a table that's complained, wants to see the manager and they're very, very upset. So you go down to see them and that's a real opportunity to bring them round there because if you think of the the family that's had the bad pizza or the bad experience, you know, they know already that you didn't cook the pizza and you didn't take the order. So what are they looking for? They're looking for genuine empathy. They're looking for a, a sense that you want to genuinely get to the bottom of it and actually you know, put it right, and, and they want to believe that it won't happen again. And you can't really do anything other than that as a leader. And that's where leaders go wrong when they're fighting crises now is they, they you know, they, they normally they get advice from the wrong people. And by that, I mean lawyers. lawyers. <laughs> so the, the, yeah. Yeah. So the, the general counsel said, well, you can't express an apology for what happened because then they could sue us. And I mean, if you take United Airlines, for example, that, that poor bloke who got punched in the face and dragged off the plane a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. I remember seeing that and the, the United Airlines put out a tweet and it said we regret having to reaccommodate this passenger and it was really, it was obviously cool. rather annoying, incredibly legalistic and the lawyer will have thought well writing a tweet that way will save us four million in the settlement but they lost a billion dollars off their stock market value within 24 hours because everyone was not only outraged by that, but even more outraged by the way that it was handled by the chief executive. So, uh, what what they I remember being in the airport, seeing that on you know reading the tweet, and CNN had split screened it with the tweet and actual video footage of the poor man's bloodied face. And I thought, well, they've not actually reaccommodated that passenger. They punched him in the face and dragged him off, and that's disgusting. Yeah, and everyone's seen it. Yeah, it, it was. Um, and what what he should have done, and I, you can almost do these things on autopilot as long as it's genuine, is the CEO should have come out straight away and said. I'm as horrified as anyone else seeing that footage. My first thought was that poor man, I will never let that happen on one of our planes ever again. Secondly, I want to apologize not only to him, but to our staff and our customers, everyone involved, because that must have been horrific. I don't know what happened, but I'm sure as hell going to get to the bottom of what happened, and I'm going to make sure that it doesn't ever happen again. This can't happen again. That would have been fine. Well, back to the pizza restaurant. Genuine empathy. Promise to get to the bottom of it. Promise that you'll learn mistakes. What else can a leader do? But most companies don't do that basic thing because and I've, I've been at the center of this before where you know a director of a client will get arrested and there's three people in the world that can truly decide how what they're actually going to do and one of them's on retreat in Sri Lanka because he's got a sick mother the other one's in on a private jet but they can't reach him and the other ones you know um won't do anything until he's spoken to the other two and it, it, big companies are paralyzed by indecision and inertia and sometimes I have to make the decision I have to say look this guy has to go but, you know, I, I have to take my my lead from the client. I can't do their job for them. It might be that they decide to suspend that person, look into it. There might be a deeper problem, a vexatious complainant or something again. You know, so there's, there's often more to this. But I need a direction of travel yeah. from clients before I can then start to, to do it. But I'll say one thing. Most people are so cynical nowadays in, in the proper sense of the word, as well as the jaded sense, is the apologies mean nothing unless you, you actually – do mean it. I mean, the, the, the chap who runs Alton Towers, for example, he handled it very well because, you know, uh, that woman who uh, lost the use of her legs because I think the one of their roller coasters went wrong. Yeah. He went on the TV news that night and he was genuinely upset. You could yeah. see it. He was yeah. in tears and Kay Burley knocked seven bells out of him on, yeah. on the TV. And don't get me wrong, she had every right to do so. She's a good journalist. But actually, most people thought he came across well, not because he sort of quote unquote handled it well like a media training example but as in the guy was gutted you know he's trying he's to run human. a place yeah. yeah he's trying to make a place where he's got staff and customers that are happy and you know the last thing he would have wanted was someone to have to have their legs amputated and he was gutted for her and for him he's and for everyone involved now that if it's real i would say you know stick them on the air so um we do a lot of sort of crisis stuff like that yeah, I saw, I had a first-hand example of this. I worked at a radio station in Birmingham, and there was a contest, and some listeners were hurt. I mean, seriously hurt. They were hospitalized because of what they'd been asked to do. I don't know if you remember, you remember the stunt. They I were, do. It's called water intoxication. 
No, no, not that one. This was this was uh, they they sat on some dry ice. That one. Oh no, I don't know that one. No, oh, did they get it, burnt terribly? Yeah, it was uh, oh. it was a thing called the coolest seats in the house. It was who could sit on it the longest. I mean, it was oh. just terrific. But I was working there at the time, and I saw a thing in the paper from the boss, and it said they all signed disclaimers. Oh, like, oh what? Yeah. Uh, what they mustn't? They just mustn't be thinking. Um, uh, and, oh, it's, as you say, they're they're, um, they're influenced by the lawyers. Yeah, it is. But it's very difficult, though. I mean, I'm not. I, I mean, first of all, that was unforgivable. He shouldn't have done that. But like, I in my book, I use a fictional example of a canoe company where you know little Timmy drowns in a in a in an outdoor adventure park, and he was in one of this company's canoes, and the press go to comment. And, and you've got to think of it from their point of view. I mean, the first thing is, you know, little Timmy has died. That's awful. So you lead on sympathy. But the second thing is. It genuinely might not have been their canoe that killed little Timmy. It might have been, you know, you don't blame a car manufacturer every time someone decides to drive a car into a brick wall. You, you, you know, it's too early to say. So you, you've got to strike a balance whilst being genuine of sort of genuine sympathy and saying you'll cooperate with the authorities, but not actually admitting it's your fault if it isn't your fault. And if you genuinely don't know, you have to find a form of words to say that. Mm. Um so it, it is, it can be very, very difficult, especially because the press, of course, do want to get you. That's what, that's what they, I don't blame journalists for that. But <laughs> if something goes wrong, they, they sense blood and um, they go for it big time. I don't blame them. Because the Daily Mail had a go at your company, didn't they? This was in July this year when... Oh, yes. Uh, this was, well, do you want to talk about that? I mean, what, what I read about it online when I was researching you was that uh, they, they said they'd found leaked emails from, from Right Angels, your PR company, that were kind of uh, saying that people could pay money to get on the honours list. I mean, what is the truth in, in, in the story there? So I have to be careful because I can't discuss um, a lot of that for legal reasons. I've okay, signed NDAs. Okay. No, no, more than yeah. happy to discuss it. Yeah. But um, I have to be very careful because I've signed NDA with with clients and there's there's litigation, even a police investigation going on to the people that stole those uh, emails and data right, from me. Right. But but it, even as the article makes clear, it doesn't actually say. It, I mean, it's a, the old thing of reading the headline. It does actually say in the article that they're not alleging that we did anything dishonest, illegal, or immoral. No. But what we no, do. Yeah. What we do for our clients is we optimize their case so that yeah. if they do want an honor and yeah. that's perfectly legitimate uh, you know i mean there's, it's not illegal and in fact they featured four of the companies in the article they itself that, yeah, that to do be that fair. so uh, so yeah but again it's, this is the problem isn't it in pr is that you know uh, why would i expect anyone to to read right through to paragraph 14 i mean i, I wouldn't do that <laughs> for someone else so you yeah. know, i'm not going to hold anyone else to a higher standard than i want to hold myself so i mean this is the this is the problem of course with uh, social media, of course, and the the tyranny of the minorities, it's called now, is it doesn't doesn't really, um, you know, you've you've really got to act quick with these things and decide whether you want to um, give give that oxygen. So I chose not to comment on that in mm -hmm. terms of social media for the for the simple reason of what's called the Streisand effect, which is, you know, the the mere act of denial and the mere act of engaging with it um, can actually make the story bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, with that, it, the one that's the irony of that that I thought was, I, I think their their issue was it was kind of suggesting that the royals are above this kind of thing and it taints the the honours list and the royals and everything. But when you think about it, what do the royals do? And for me, like you know, you you look you are a PR, you run a PR agency that finds people who have a job. They might be in showbiz, they might be in some corporate or whatever, and they do their job. And then on top of that there's PR but the royals it seems that all they do is PR so you know that's that is their job is to get PR for the royals and the system so it seems, it seems it seem, to me yeah, I, I mean I'm more than happy if the government want to change the rules I mean yeah. I, I act within the law then I'm all for that but the problem that you have as you just said is so many so many jobs within the civil service and indeed the royals they get honors automatically it's a lot yeah. of them aren't earned and just because your local lollipop lady gets an mba which to be fair i'm sure she deserves do doesn't it doesn't mean that you know lots of high court judges chief executives of global businesses don't get mbes cbs and so on it's part of the the, the way that government work and and, I, and the problem is that we're, we're slightly tinkering with it at the sides based on this sort of uh, rose tinted view of what the honors system is and and so many you know people are um you know, optimizing their, their case for it. And it's perfectly legal. If it became 
if it became illegal, then no one would do it. But let's let's be clear. No one is suggesting, and not even the Daily Mail, that the Honours Committee that decides these things is is anything other than independent and just receives applications and nominations, checks them out, does their due diligence, and then decides themselves whether, you know, checks the truth of claims. So in, in a sense, it's a bit like, you know, if you apply for a visa, there's often companies that will make sure that you've ticked all the right boxes and, you know, done everything else to, to optimise your case. They would never say you've got to lie to uh, obtain the visa, nor lie by omission. But, it, you know, it's about putting your best case forward. So that that's what we do. And I, I would say that it's neither immoral or illegal. I mean, it's certainly not illegal. But if so, if, if the government want to say that these things are going to be outlawed, then so be it. Of course, we then wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, just one last one on the royals then before we get on to the podcast. If we're talking about PR, Harry and Meghan seem to... The press don't seem to be in love with them at the moment, no matter what they do. Um, if you were handling the account of Harry and Meghan, how would you position them? It's a million dollar question, that really, because I all of this flows from the. Uh, I mean, the Daily Mail are out to get Megan. It's n- n- no, right. you know, it's not. It, there's just no ways, two ways about it. And, and you know, whether that's right or wrong is, is is something that we can discuss. But they are out to get them, and a lot of it is based on. I think it's a mixture of things. I, I do think racism comes into it. I uh-huh. think um, Megan's skin color. I also think the fact that she's, you know, North American. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of things. She's taken a different approach to the press than, say, Kate has done, because Kate is very much the traditional, you know, heir to the throne's wife, you know, shaking hands, saying pleasant things, whereas Meghan has called out the press regularly and, is, you know, comes from Hollywood. I think there's an anti-Hollywood thing there as well. Yeah. Um, I think there's so many things that have added up, and I, I, I can see it myself when my own relationships have faltered, um, you know, with people, and then you get turned over by the media. That a lot of the time, when you're reading press, um, and it's negative about someone, it's it, it's not the story that's interesting. It's the story behind the story. And I, I think Megan has, rightly or wrongly, fallen out with three or four very powerful media figures behind the scenes. Piers Morgan might be one of them, of course. He was very, very friendly with her at first. They had a falling out, and now he's consistently against her. Now, whether he's right or wrong on that. So, so I, I think this is the, this. is we're back down to the sort of the pizza shop manager as he's walking down the stairs from his office to, 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 to greet that fictional table of disgruntled customers. Is how, how he wants to handle it is entirely up to him, really. And I think Megan has decided I, I don't i don't blame her nor do i think she's right or wrong but she's clearly taken a view that she didn't want the kind of buddy buddy sycophant type relationships with the press she's she stood up for herself and you know she's done it in a certain way that's rankle the press and and so on and i think the thing with her father as well is incredibly uh, upsetting really i i mean having read it about quite a lot of it in detail you can see that he's obviously a very very um vulnerable man you know several health problems no money and you know I, th- I think there's obviously a huge miscommunication that just happened be- behind before the wedding and um he's handled it in a certain way and he's decided to cooperate with the the press really but for me it's more of a family family um tragedy more than a, a press tragedy that's 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 the bit that worries me and if she if she wrote a private letter to her father it is her copyright and she's entitled to privacy, but he's also entitled as the recipient of that letter to give it to the papers if he wants legally. Yeah. What I would say is, is that a gentlemanly thing to do? Is that something that if I, if I, if a friend was asking me, should I reveal a private letter from my own daughter to the press? I'd say, what are you thinking about man? Absolutely <laughs> yeah. not. So yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot to this and I just think it's a tragedy for all concerned. So is there anything she can do then to repair her image with the British press? I don't think so, but I, I, I also think that it's gone beyond that now because I don't think she'd want to. She would see that as a defeat. Uh, you know, it, there comes a point in a relationship with someone's relationship with the media and certain press organisations where it's be, it's become damaged beyond repair. And I, I, I think, you know, the, the Mail, unless they change their editor and five or six years from now things change, then, um, y- you know, you might get a different going on. But I think both sides are so dug in now that, that it's probably best best sorted with one of them you know quote unquote winning so if she if she can't turn around her image would she be would her her and harry be better to just keep quiet for a while then no i think they just have to acknowledge that um i mean it comes with the path of the course isn't it if you have a hollywood career particularly if you marry a royal you're gonna get 
I mean, the press have this public interest defence, don't they, with, with the royals? Because they can say, you know, she's, she's you we're know, exit line to the throne. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Or even though we're, we're technically not with them, though. But yeah, yeah. they're public figures. Yeah. So, you know, this is just a price that they they have to pay. But there's a wider, wider, deeper thing to consider, which is just how far can the press actually go in? I mean, we're at the, the, the cusp here of royals, aren't we? Because they are a family. But... But, you know, that letter to her father was an incredibly personal, very deep family thing. And I can't, for me personally, I can't see what the public interest is in, yeah. in doing that. And let's be honest, 95% of, even though there might be a public interest defence, let's be honest, most people just wanted the salacious bit of gossip, Yeah, you oh, know, of, of the family fallout. And that, that's the problem with the press, unfortunately. So, I don't, you know, I don't blame the Daily Mail want, wanting to do this, morals aside. I mean, there's clear commercial imperative. It would have drove clicks and drove sales on the newsstand. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd have got hold of that letter, would you have put it out? In what capacity? Well, would you have, you know, put it out to media agencies? Would you touted it out? Um, oh, no, I see. Because you'd be representing her, wouldn't you? I get what I get what you mean. Yeah. I well, if I was mean. him, if I was a father yeah. uh, and I was desperate for money, I, I would hope that I would still say no. He yeah. obviously was paid for that. Yeah. If I was representing... Um, her then i would have tried to find a way to have got it out in a way that they wanted so i've had this several times where um i mean probably two or three dozen times now where celebrities and various high profile figures come to me for advice and they've come because the media are about to run a story on them that's something that they that they want to uh, they don't want in the press frankly and and my job there is to is to persuade them of the inevitability of it is i have no magic wand that says um that I'm going to be able to make this go away because wh why would a journalist do that? You know, just, just to get a favor from some PR guy that the world doesn't work like that. But what we can do is acknowledge the inevitability of it and then mitigate it as much as possible, do deals or sometimes offer to be a bit more cooperative, either give a longer statement or if there is something that we've got in rebuttal, then we'll actually offer the evidence and then sort of you end up negotiating. OK, so, Mr. Journalist, you've got six things you're going to say. Well, can you not mention that six thing because it involves that person's mother or whatever? And could you not mention the medical diagnosis on point five? And for that, we'll give you X, Y and Z and, you know, a lot more of a cooperative. And most people's human nature is to just say, right, Shut, you know, pull the shutters up, not cooperate with them. And, you know, that that's actually the worst thing ever because then it, it, even in corporate life as well is the journalist is then going to run on it and they're going to spend all of that newsprint speculating as to what your motive might have been and what your options are. Whereas if you tell them what your motive was and which what you're going to do about it, then even though there is still a story, you, you, you're losing, you know, you're getting rid of all that damaging acres of newsprint that speculate what you might have done when you already know what you're going to do and then the, the journalists can do that. Do you think Philip Schofield did that? I can't discuss that. Oh, is he a client? All right, I'm oh, sorry, I, just in case. All right, if you can't discuss it, fine. No, totally fine. Totally fine. But, but uh, for what it's worth, I think the way he handled that was was quite brilliant. I think he came out, he came out on top actually, um, because it must have been about to to come out, and and he just got in front of it. And uh, okay, <laughs> totally I mean, not fine. speaking about that particular case, but yes. in general, I, I I think that that's right. I mean, you you often see it where if a celebrity is tweeting at eleven p.m. at night with an announcement, that's because he or she has been has been pushed into it. But yeah. that's you know that 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 does happen. I mean, the other alternative that you do is you go you go to another outlet completely and and give them the interview, and, and there you've got no um, you've you've kind of you can have an unfettered negotiation because that you also don't have what you you know what the, the the second news outlet might not have the evidence of the first one. So if you act quickly, and in fact that's one of the reasons often why journalists don't, uh, are so sort of vociferous when they say you know we must have your response by midnight tonight because a classic spoiler attempt is to spoil it is to go to a rival news one give it you know uh, organization give your side of the story get it out there and then inevitably it's unfair on the oh, unfair from that the the person's point of view that you know the journalist's point of view because they've then lost the opportunity to to, to break that story yeah um so yeah. yeah i mean there's a lot of negotiation bit behind the scenes i had a um, uh, uh, three or four years ago, I had a client who was a celebrity and a radio presenter and ha happily married. And uh, uh, um, uh, he was uh, having a, 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 an affair with a man. Uh, he's obviously purported to be straight and was actually bisexual and was having an affair with a man. And the son were going to turn him over. Uh, they had acres and acres of affidavits and so on from the, the young man that he was seeing. And, 
you know, the first thing there was to, to, to persuade him and his wife to sort of engage with it and do the whole, you know, sitting on the sofa and talking openly about this. And then instead of sort of six pages from the uh, the young man, it was I think he was relegated to about a quarter of page six and the rest of it was him and his wife. And it, I mean, it was the best of a bad job. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I count as a significant win and the, the, all of the win was vested in the fact that that person was persuaded to do it because there's always that hope of, well, if we don't cooperate, maybe it'll go away. Not with a 72 page affidavit, what's on? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to be smart about it and just defuse it. Yeah. It's tough, though, because, like, you know, often in these situations, you're dealing with the the manifestation of very deep, very deep, much deeper problems. I mean, you know, I work with a a bank and um, they've, they've gone through some tough times in the last year or so and part of the I can see all of the problems that they've had over the years haven't been because of the problems themselves it's because the chairman and the chief executive were on barely on speaking terms right. and you know that they would they would say hello to each other in the corridor if other people were in the corridor to appear professional but if there was no one else in the corridor they would literally just blank each other as they passed each other they would never speak even a single word and it was just utterly dysfunctional and that dysfunction manifested itself a few years later in some problems that the bank got into and then you think well um you know i'm presented with a problem that the ft are going to run a story on x y and z and i'm thinking well how can i solve this in two hours when the board themselves have turned a blind eye to it for five years do you yeah. see what I mean? It's, yeah. it, it, sometimes you just have to engage with it. Yeah. All right. Hey, fascinating world you live in. Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, no, Thank really. You. And the podcast, terrific. It's called Media Masters. What was the, the, the motivation to start it? Was it because you were working and meeting these interesting people and you thought they've got tales to tell? We'd already decided, because I, I work with thought leaders, and one of the things that we're trying to do over the years is rather than just sort of writing things and sort of selling them in. And we were trying to get our clients to sort of own the message and, you know, start to do thought leadership that, uh, on platforms that they'd own, so their blog and so on. And so we had three or four podcasts that we'd created for clients where, you know, we would get them on other people's podcasts, but we also wanted them to be the presenter of their own podcasts and have guests come on it and so on and so forth. And it's there were several reasons, really. I mean, the first thing is a client was asking me about, you know, how to how to – go about presenting a podcast and I was giving them an advice and it suddenly struck me that I was the worst kind of PR cliche that I was advising <laughs> a client on how to present a podcast having got zero experience myself of presenting any podcast in my life so there was that where I thought well if you know I really ought to you really ought to present my own so I can know firsthand what works and what doesn't and then I thought well I'm interested in the media and I had three or four contacts and I just, just thought I'd give it a go, really. So we, we started initially, and we called it Media Focus. And it was a little bit nicked from the media show, really, where we had three or four guests each week, and we'd sort of digest that week's news. Uh -huh. And um, it was hell, really, because you try to get... <laughs> You try to get three topics and three guests, and each one wants to talk about one topic and knows very little about the other two. So you get a TV guy on, and then there'd also be some legal issue to do with, you know, that was in the news about journalism, and he or she would know nothing about it. So trying to get three guests um, and three topics where they all could talk a little bit around it, and I was finding that there were there were. Um, you know, dating quite quickly because I, you know, who wants to watch last week's ten o'clock news with Hugh Edwards? And because it's done, isn't it? So yeah, and that's the thing um, with podcasts is the long tail. You want to you know, make it make the most of that. Yeah, yeah. So we so and also one of them would back out because of whatever ten minutes before a family problem or traffic problems or whatever. So it was a nightmare. So we did three of those a week a month, and then every fourth one we did what we called Media Masters, which was a one to one interview. And I was looking at the figures after a few months and. The Media Masters one outperformed the other ones by 100 to 1. I mean, we were getting thousands of listeners for those, and it was actually quite easy to get one person in a studio at one moment. We could record at any time and just chat, yeah. whereas the other one was all of this agony to try and contrive three topics and get three guests and backup guests and so on, and it was it was getting 10% of the figures of the other one, and it suddenly struck me there and then, why don't we just do nothing but Media Masters? So... Um, so we did that. We, we rebranded the whole thing, and then we went one-to-one. -one. So um, I, And that took about three or four months. And then since then, we sort of taken off. I mean, my first first few guests were sort of my own friends and out my own Rolodex. And, um, you know, then we started to get some big names. Jeremy Vine was a big big, uh, big sort of early guest because I used to go on his show a lot, and uh, he's a friend of mine. Nice bloke, and he came on as a favour to me, really. Great and, episode, uh, too. Yeah. Thank you. And he was on Strictly and various other things. So he sort of, that was the first one that sort of did it. And we then... 
it's I suppose it's like climbing a ladder really. You get guests of a certain type on and that encourages more and people think, Oh, if that guest has been on then um, you know. But, I mean I've got the editor of Vanity Fair coming on in a couple of weeks and I've already had Tina Brown and Graydon Carter on. So you know, do you see what I mean? She's yeah. thinking, well it's par for the course. So yeah. I, I I think there was that and then um what's been really gratifying now, is sort of four and a half years in or whatever it is, is um you know, people who rightly turned me down in the beginning because we weren't big enough then for them to warrant them coming on. They've, they've turned their, they've t- you know changed their mind, and we've you know over the last couple of years, people that turned me down four years ago have, have asked to come on, and that's yeah. been particularly gratifying because it feels like we've reached a certain level of seniority now. And I mean, to be honest, we it is a genuinely amazing thing. I'd love doing it. I learned so much, but it's I'd say about eighty percent of the guests we get now actually ask to come on. Yeah, and uh, I've got an amazing, amazing, um, amazing um, sort of uh, modus operandi now, where I can b- basically pick and choose who I want on, who I think would be be interesting, and uh, I mean that's just incredible to 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 got to where I am. But it, as I say, it only started as a as a sort of bit on the side, really, and I think it's just it's just been so beneficial to me. I've learned so much. It's really grown my network as well, and sort of. Um, you know, the big names that we've had on as well have really sort of helped drive traffic to the podcast. And that's one of the best things is um, we had Perez Hilton on many, many years ago, who was a lovely guy. And he has sort of 12 million followers. I was in Beverly Hills, went to his house, recorded it. And then he did two or three tweets that he'd been on it. And I think it drove like 30,000 clicks from sort of three or four tweets. Wow. And that's the thing, you know, well, if you've got 12 million followers and you tweet that you're on media masters and click here to listen then you know that's the bit that excited me is you know um people want to talk about their career and they look at the other names that have been on and i think that's that's enough for them really they then think right let's do it and then they tweet and put on their linkedin and their facebook they they were on it so it becomes like a virtuous circle so i feel like um you know it was a huge boulder at the beginning that it takes huge amounts of effort to sort of get it going but now that it's sort of running of its own accord it's um it, it works really, really well. And I've got a, a production team because we produce many other podcasts. So, it, it you know, the intro and, the, and I have a few sort of what I call safety net questions, just if I feel I'm going to dry up, there's a few, or, or maybe points not to forget, but I don't have like a list of questions, but my producer does that. And so all I literally do is just chat for an hour, yeah. um, read the introduction. Um, and so it works like clockwork and um, I couldn't be more pleased with it. I like the way you put yourself in it as well. And I know that, you know, I looked at some of the comments on it. Some people have a go at you for this, but I like the way that you share a bit of your life and talk about, you know, different things about you. And uh, Because I like podcasts that are like that, that are more of a conversation. Obviously, the guest's going to dominate it, but I just like the way that you share. Do you you read those comments and take any notice of them? I don't, because I tell my clients for their own mental health not to read comments because it you, you, you all it takes is one or two comments and it could ruin your day so i i my, my assistant claire reads comments and she, and i've told her if there's anything that's genuine like actionable or untrue or something that's so bad that, that i need to do something about it then she should tell me but if not don't if it just says i'm not very good then then you know don't don't tell me that because you can't please everyone all of the time anyway. Yeah. I mean, I, I've read some amazing books and you go on Amazon and, you know, 80% say it's great and then 20% just slate it. So you, you're never going to do do that. And I, I find myself as well that, um, you know, some, some clients, I, I mean, like Melvin Bragg, I, you know, I love in our time, but sometimes he talks too much and then other times he doesn't. And then you can never get it right. I mean, I, I've got a lot more sympathy for someone like Melvin Bragg because he does it live as well. Yeah. Where, you know, you've got some quantum physicist on and he, he says that I need to explain Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in full <laughs> before I can talk about, you know, why the, the universe is, why free will doesn't exist. So you, you can tell, you can hear sort of Melvin sort of giving him seven or eight minutes thinking, well, okay, you're going into too much detail now. And I, I can, so it's more difficult to get right. And it's, I don't sort of start a podcast, I'm sure you do, and say, right, I'm going to involve myself of 7.3 percent of airtime you just you just do what's natural really yeah I, one of the other things i like about it is i can't remember how i found the podcast but it was probably there was a particular guest that i found and they turned out to be on your podcast that's often how i find podcasts but my, what's been the real treat is you know once i subscribed and 
I was running a radio station in London. At the end of my day on the way home, it was my little treat to listen to Media Masters as part of the unwinding because it was just like nothing to do with the day I'd had and nothing to do with the day I'm going to have tomorrow or any of the problems I've got to solve or any of the fires I've got to put out. I can just listen to this and listen to these inspirational people. It's when I actually discover on your podcast people I've never heard of. And in fact, my favorite guest of yours to my great shame, I can't remember his name, and I'm hopefully, hopefully you're going to remind me now. It was a guy who set up, he, he came up with the FC UK logo for French Connection. It was a guy from the Midlands, and he talked about his life in advertising. And, and he was Trevor, just, he was Trevor just Beatty. Terrific. Is that him? He was just terrific. That's actually my favorite guest of my favorite episodes. Do, He's do, a great guy. Do, do you have a favorite guest? I have loads of different favourite guests, really. Um, for, I, that I, sounds like a cop out, Paul. You don't want to offend yeah, anyone. I understand. Yeah. There's a bit of PR going on there. No, it's actually more about the, <laughs> the agony of choice, really. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I, the seven or eight memorable episodes stand out because of what I've sort of learned in in my own self. I mean, I, Ben Page was one of my early ones because he's an old mate of mine is Ben and he runs Ipsos Mori, the polling company. And I think he was, he was one of the earliest ones we ever did. And he said that he, um, what always struck me is he, um, he kind of, he kind of became a pollster just because it was advertising media guardian after he'd finished his degree, but, and just viewed it as something that he was going to do, um, while he found something else. It was just like, and then within a blink of an eye, you know what life's like, he was suddenly been there 10 years and he was just sort of, you know, a couple of rungs up the ladder up, but nothing major. And uh, someone described him as a pollster uh, when he was speaking at something. And he thought, well, that can't be right. And then suddenly he thought to himself, there was a light bulb moment. And he thought, well, I actually am a pollster, aren't I? If I've been doing this for 10 years, why am I denying what I am? I've been in polling for 10 years. I am a pollster. And the, the, then the next thought, once he kind of came out to himself and admitted to himself that he was a pollster, his next thought was... Well, if I'm going to be a pollster, I, I, I'm ambitious. I, I want to be the best pollster in the world. I want to lead this organisation and so on. And, and I really like that because he, he then said, right, if I am going to be a pollster, which I, I clearly am, then I'm going to be the best in the world. And then I think within five or six years, he was chief executive of Ipsos Mori at that point. And obviously, he's one of the biggest names in polling in the world now. And uh, he's a lovely bloke. But I really, there's, there's, I think the sort of little nuggets of insight and value that I picked up along the way. And, you know, I, I love things like that, where you can sort of really put yourself in, in the position. I mean, Trevor, for example, what I like about Trevor is he's one of the most humble people you've ever met. And he's funny. He's witty. Yeah. And he's made a, he's made a, a ton of money. And he's just like a lot of our clients, actually, that he genuinely cares about making the world a better place now. So he's got enough money in the bank, and now he wants to give it away and actually make a difference. So he, he set up a foundation named after his late mother and father, and he, he gives away money to poor people. He's got he set up an initiative called the Bank of Mum and Dad, as you yeah, know, remember from the about podcast. It. Yeah. And basically, if you're absolutely on your ass and you, you email them, you can get a, 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 an interest-free loan of 500 quid pay back whenever you can and you know he's dished out hundreds of these yeah. and it, it, the dignity of that is unbelievable he's really genuinely trying to make a difference and sort of you know sort of not forget where he came from because he came from nothing yeah. and i've learned learned that with a lot of people is there's this the survivorship bias isn't there that when you you know because we interview successful people you you forget about all the people that didn't make it along the way. So there was a guy who's a friend of mine, Ken Hertz. He's a Hollywood lawyer and agent. And that was another one that stuck with me. And he acts for loads of loads of sort of Hollywood celebs and actors and so on. I actually had lunch. He invited me to stay for lunch with him after the podcast in his office. And Jaden Smith, you know, was just starring as the karate kid. He came and sat with us for an hour. And we all ate a sandwich <laughs> together. It was quite surreal. But he was saying to me that, that you know, that, there's, that he said, you know, people like Beyonce and people like Will Smith, there's, there's hundreds of people that are talented like that. And he said, it's not to demean the massive talent that Beyonce and Will Smith have got. He said, they're amazing. He said, but there's hundreds of other amazing people that have sat waiting on tables for 20 years in Hollywood that never get their break. And it's just luck. That's what he was saying. He said, you all, you all look at, he, he said, Beyonce is worth hundreds of millions and sings at the president's inauguration. And there's someone who's just as good a singer who's waiting tables at Denny's uh, and living on tips. He said, both of them are just as talented and neither of them have done anything wrong. He said, but that's the brutal effect of, of, of survivorship bias is, is this Hollywood thing is that we only care about the people who have made it like they've got some special secret sauce. And the reality is, is they've, they've worked hard. 
they've got a talent and they've got a lucky break. And that's only one extra box ticked from the person who's waiting your table in Hollywood. And I yeah. thought that was fascinating as well, how we idolise this secret source element of of success as if as if Beyonce is clever and the person waiting the tables isn't so there's loads of things I've learned over the over the years life advice and uh, and so on how the media actually works and um you know where the power lies it's just been it's just been absolutely great it's been I think my the podcast I was saying this to my wife the other day I think it's the best thing I've ever done in my life because it has it has taught me so much um I don't know of any other um sort of mechanism where I could go to the very biggest people in the world in my own industry and ask them anything I like for an hour and have them talk to me. You know, I, it is it is an incredible privilege. And, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot. It's grown my my network hugely. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I just think it's been been great. I, I, it's just born of curiosity, but it, it really has paid off in spades. And I must say as well, even though even though genuinely it's not meant as a commercial initiative, there's no sponsorship and I've never set out to monetize it in any way. It has helped me grow my own business. And, and I think it's helped me grow my business because I, because I, my intent is for it to not grow the business. So it's, it, I don't see it as a business development thing. And then I think my sort of pureness of intent then means that it, that's why it helps me because it has, you know, introduced me to lots of opportunities and all kinds of things. I've had guests that have referred me to their their bosses and then I've had, you know, they've hired me and and so on. And and it, but I've never I've never had a guest on to try and win them as business because I mean, I think my listeners wouldn't forgive me if they had if I had someone that was clearly contrived and not relevant and I was only doing it to try and line my pockets. But actually not having that intent has been the best thing for it really because then I've had you know some absolutely huge names on as you've said yeah who was the trickiest guest you've had then oh i mean obviously discretion is the better part of valor well, you don't have to name them but you could give us a clue and what the problem was i had a recently retired editor of a very very prestigious newspaper um who who was not only full of himself but uh <laughs> Was it was almost mute? I, 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 you know, like you and I could chat. And I, what I like with guests is I can just ask a very broad, open question and then just sort of set them off. Do you know what I mean? Like the Duracell bunny type thing and yeah. steer them in. But but like you get you get some people that are sort of just mute. They they just they'll like I said to this person, how did you take the newspaper to be how successful it was? And he just said, well, it was, it was about building a great team. And that's, that's, all, that's he all he said. said. And then I almost sort of looked at my watch and said, well, we've, we've got another 58 minutes. Son, so, you know, do you want to, do you want to carry on? Um, and I just, but, you know, part, you know, I try to be, try to sort of not be judgmental because it might, you might have had a bad day. He might be tired. He might, he didn't, he might have been misbriefed as to how long the, the interview was. I, I don't know. But so you, you get people that, that are, um, that are, um, you're not as cooperative as you would like or i mean sometimes it could be because they're introverted so you, you have to just talk for a bit longer or you just make a few cuts i've had a few people that have been quite keen to promote you know whatever they're they're on and again you have that it's weird when that happens because like it's like if you watch graham norton and tom cruise is on you know he's on there because the new mission impossible movies yeah. out, and that's fine and you actually the thing is you actually do want to see the latest mission impossible and you want him to say what happened on the set and all of that so it's kind of kind of the you know the audience are in on it but when it's more it's weird when it's a podcast if someone's got a book to come out or whatever that um that you you have to try and you know give them enough time so that they feel that they've had enough time to sit talk about it but yeah. um but but often that's the i mean like jeffrey archer came on and um you know, he had a new book to promote. He asked to come on. His team asked to, asked for him to come on. I said, "Yeah, I think he's great. I've read all his prison diaries." And uh, he um, he came on it and he said what, what it was about. But I, I don't think he. I think we had such a nice chat actually because he wasn't really that bothered about promoting his latest book. I think he was just doing it because the his publishers had said. But we actually had a really interesting conversation because I had genuinely read his prison diaries, and I think most people had just asked him a few cursory questions about them you know, from a brief and I'd actually sort of really engage with him. And I mean, he said that, um, um, he's, he, he actually said that his own stupidity put him in prison and he blamed himself and took responsibility for being in prison, which is he'd never done before. And, um, you know, I thought that was an amazing 
admission, but I, I didn't sort of press release it or anything like that the, the next day. Because again, I'm trying to not sort of stitch up my clients. I'm, I think part of, if I was like a proper journalist presenting a proper, if this was like the Times is media podcast, I think I would be trying to sort of get the, the guests to, not to entrap them or trip them up, but just to try to get them to say something newsworthy that I could write a page lead about the next day. Yeah. I don't do that. And click I just base, literally yeah. just have a chat. Yeah, and I don't yeah. blame them for that. They've got, yeah. to, they've got to get listeners and so on. But I think because I don't need loads of listeners, I think that's why I'm sort of a little bit more relaxed about it. And I also think it means that people are more willing to come on. And then the final thing I'd say on that is I do I do rely on the guests tweeting and putting on their social media that they, they were on. And if they they weren't happy with it, then I don't think they would. So I Good think, again, point. that sort of yeah. relaxed vibe actually helps. Yeah, yeah, because that's how I get a lot of people to listen to podcast radio. Because podcast radio there is to, it, it's to raise awareness of podcasts, but we also want to raise the awareness of podcast radio. And it is of course nice. You do. It's, it's nice when, when, when guests tweet out. So I hope you've had a nice time on this podcast. I have. You've asked me some great questions. I mean, to be honest, it's weird to be on this side of the, the, is the it? interview. Does, because does it happen yeah. very often? No, no. Well, I, I'm asked a lot. I'm asked a lot of times to do go on various things, but I, to be honest, I, I can't. I am quite chatty in real life, but I've, the one skill I've learned by doing the podcast is just to shut the hell up. I am very much, um, you know, that was. I think that was some one of my early uh, early friends. Uh, one of my friends listened to a few early ones, and he said, "Paul, you're great." He said, "But you've got to realise you've got to shut up. It's, <laughs> you know, you can't be." 50% of the airtime for each one, you've got to be 10%. He said, so, you know, say your piece and then shut up. And I've always remembered that as the best advice I've ever got. I do, I do try to do that. I mean, you, you, as a listener, you must realize that I'm waffling on now, but I, I try to all. let the listeners get on with it when it's my own podcast. And what podcast inspire you? Ooh. That, I mean, that's, that's a really good one, isn't it? I mean, I, I listen to so many of them. I mean, I'm listening to Bad People at the moment on BBC Sounds. That's um, What's that one? I haven't heard that one yet. What's, what's that oh, one it's about? really good. It's a comedian and a psychologist, and they talk about, um, like, killers and murderers and fraudsters and so on, and they're really trying to get under the skin of what is evil and, you know, whether whether there are bad people or whether they're just victims of circumstance and just made some wrong choices. And I love The Naked Scientist as well on yeah. and Five Live. I love Crowd Science on BBC World. Um, What's that one? Your dead. Oh, crowd science is really good. Uh, so a lady called Marnie Chesterton, and she presents. But basically, what they do is um, people ring in from all over the world and ask the most obscure questions, and then they get experts on it. So it's just like um, brilliant. Oh yeah, they'll yeah. say, well, you know, why, why don't clouds fall out of the sky? And you know, so they'll get they'll get meteorologists on and all of this kind of stuff. They did one years ago about what, how do planes fly. Yeah. And they got a quantum physicist on and a fluid dynamic person. And then what was really <laughs> interesting is we kind of roughly know why planes stay in the air, but we don't quite know even now. It's really weird. It's like they had one on about gravity a few years ago. And we, we know everything about gravity in terms of how it works and blah, blah, blah. But we just still don't know what it is. Yeah. And that was fascinating. So you, you sort of go through the, all the bits about we can tell everything that gravity will and won't do to within a micron. But if you actually ask a quantum physicist what gravity is, they go, search me, Gov. Don't know. Right. Wow. And that, that, so, yeah, love love podcasts. Absolutely love them. So what's next for Paul Blanchard? So I'm um, carrying on with my business, uh, Right Angles. Uh, I'm writing a second book. Um which should be coming out toward the end of this year. And I'm also launching another venture as well. So, I mean, we produce a lot of podcasts ourselves for clients, but they're part of our thought leadership retainer model, whereas the, the sister business I'm launching is called Podcast Partners, and where we're going to do joint venture podcasts with the presenter. So we, t we take someone. We've already done one with uh, Anthony Scaramucci, who um, is a, a friend of mine, and uh, we've launched Mooch FM. Yeah, and th that's a joint venture. So he presents it and tweets about it, but we we decide the guests produce it, write the scripts, and you know do all the editing and the branding and the upload and all the promotion, and we're going to monetize it as well. And it's fifty fifty, so it's not it's it's a different model to the sort of hundreds of podcast companies that will charge someone a grand a month or whatever to, to do a podcast. This is one where you know we'll we'll do it for you as our sweat equity. So that's exciting because we've identified a lot of people who you know, should be podcasting really, but have either never thought to or don't want to spend two, three grand a month 
of their own money to sort of get it off the ground. You know, this might it's a shared risk model, really. The the most they're going to risk is their their time and their in theory their reputation if it, if it quote unquote fails. But uh, we don't think it will. So so that's interesting. And um, just frankly, just getting through this pandemic. I yeah. mean, you know, if yeah. I can get out of it alive and haven't gone bankrupt and uh, lost everything, then uh, I mean, so many other people are. It's just I'm very very grateful for the fact that things could be a lot worse for me. Um, how are you finding it? Well, it's changed my world. I, you know, as I say, I was I was running this radio station in London, and I got uh, I got let go in February, and then the oh. yeah, and then so I wasn't that worried, you know, because I've been in radio a while, and I had a lot of mates, and I had uh, I had meetings set up, and I had a couple of interviews set up here and there, and then of course along comes a pandemic, and everything got cancelled, and I thought, well, this severance package isn't going to last forever. I've got to work out mm. something to do. So I went online and I found out that you can set up a business of your own uh, narrating and producing audio books. And I've been doing that. And since May, I've produced 37 audio books and I'm doing quite nicely. Thank you very much. And it's something I would never I, mean, I, I just, you know, do them from my wardrobe. Uh, I wow. obviously have the weekly show on podcast radio, which pays a little bit. But, you know, the bulk of my my living now comes from producing audio books. And some of them they pay you per finished hour. And some of them you get a, a 50 percent royalty share in the book. So there's a passive income coming in and wow. I'm just Good doing great. And, you know, so hate to say it because, you know, a pandemic is an awful, horrible thing. But I've come out great from it. So, yeah, weird, isn't it? How it just, it's changed the world, this thing. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's going to be the best thing for many things, like in terms of, you know, the whole great reset argument, isn't it? That people have, um, that it's given that people an opportunity to pause and decide what's right for them. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that the, the world will ever be the same again. I mean, you know, I've got 10 people and, you know, my team have already said they want to work from home half the working week, even when we have an office. So then I think, yeah. well, what's the point in having two or three people in every day? Because we, we should all come in Monday, Tuesday. So we're all got the benefit of coming in. And, and then you think, well, am I going to rent an office that's empty three days a week? I mean, do I buddy up with another company and timeshare it? I mean, there's lo- I, I just think there's loads. It's like you're pulling on one string of the tapestry. The whole thing's going to unravel. You know, there's so many knock-on consequences now in terms of how things are going to change that I don't think that we've realized yet what's actually going to change and what's going to stay the same. Yeah, just an amazing time. Paul Blanchard, the podcast is called Media Masters. Get it wherever you get podcasts because it is a terrific listen. It's inspirational. Hey, thanks for your time today, Paul. It's been fab. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for yours, Graham. And yours too. All the best to you, sir.